oh Lord, (laughs) we so desperately need you as your people in this nation. Lord, we do pray for our president. Pray, Lord, for him to realize the enormity of what it is that he's doing and even not doing. Lord, I pray that you would change his heart, that he might change his mind. Lord, it's certainly never too late to pray for an awakening in this country. Lord, while we know that we're not mentioned in the pages of Bible prophecy, we do know that there's nothing too hard for you. We also know that you'll never violate the will of man. But at the same time, Lord, we would just pray for this nation. Lord, we pray for your church in this nation as it would seem that things may, should you tarry, become increasingly more difficult for us as believers. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us, yet encourage us. And Lord, I also pray that all of us would come to that place of acceptance, that we would realize that this world is not our home, that we should never put our hope in a political candidate or a political process. That, Lord, when we see all that is happening in this nation, that it would really cause us, even force us to let go of this world, the things of this world, that we might get hold of you and watch for you and be ready for you and your soon return. Lord, thank you. Thank you that this is a much needed reminder for us as to how much closer the rapture is than really any of us might even think. Lord, with that, we would simply pray, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. Lord, tonight as we are open, opening up our Bibles and preparing our hearts to receive what you have for us here in the book of Judges. I pray that just the drama of the week and the, the disappointment even of the week would create within us a desire to want to hear from you that word fitly spoken. But Lord, we really need for the Holy Spirit to keep all of the events of the week at bay that we might have unfettered access to your word. And so too, Lord, that you might have unfettered access to our hearts. So Lord, minister to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, uh, last week we um, only got to verse 1, uh, but tonight we'll uh, pick it up in verse 2, but um, let, let's read verse 1, because I want to give you kind of the, uh, the backstory again so that the rest of the chapter makes sense. Now, it says, now the men of Ephraim said to him, speaking of Gideon, why have you done this to us by not calling us when you went to fight with the Midianites? And they reprimanded him sharply. So here, here's, the, uh, here's the story. Here's what's happening here. Uh, Gideon has just come back from defeating 135,000 Medeanites with only 300 uh, men whom we believe were uh, lame, blind, crippled, old, fat. Hope you don't mind me saying that. <laughs> but um, these were men who were 
uh, you know, really uh, unable, even if they wanted to, to take any of the credit for this miraculous defeat of the Midianites. And so you would think that the Israelites who had been heretofore oppressed by and impoverished by the Medeanites who would come every year at harvest time and steal all of their grain, all of their crops that they had worked all year for. They would steal everything and what they wouldn't steal they would destroy leaving nothing for the Israelites which is why the Israelites were impoverished literally. And so you would think that when Gideon returns with this defeat, this victory, this miraculous victory and defeat of the Midianites in his hip pocket, that he would just be welcomed with a parade down the streets of New York City. Well, he couldn't do that now, but uh, or then for that matter, but I think you get the point. You, you know, coming back from war with victory and he's celebrated and, you know, all of the accolades and all of the applause and all of the thanks and all of the praise and yet we get the antithesis of that. Instead of that, he's reprimanded sharply. He's rebuked. They complain against him. They falsely accuse him. Of what? Not calling them so that they too could have been involved in the battle, so that they too could be the recipients of all the applause and accolades, and in their pride, touch the glory that belonged only to the Lord. And that's the thanks he gets. And that's really, for the most part, why we spent the entire evening last week in just verse 1. We looked at uh, why it is that they would do that. And in that, we found why it is that we do that. Because we do the same thing. We're all prone to complain. And so we looked at five reasons why people complain. Now, that sets up the stage for verse 2 where we read Gideon's response to them in the face of this, this harsh and severe rebuke. And I got to tell you, before we read verses 2 and 3, I would not have responded this way. And neither would have you either. So don't look at me all spiritual and pious. Now listen to Gideon's response. It's amazing. So he said to them, what have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? God, verse 3, has delivered into your hands the princes of Median, Oreb, and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger toward him subsided when he said that. <laughs> oh, my, my hat's off to Gideon. I mean, this is so fascinating for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that he completely disarms them. He completely turns away all of their anger, all of their harshness. I mean, he totally turns around what could have arguably been an all-out slugfest with those who had so unfairly come against him and falsely accused him. I mean, let, let's be honest. How many of us in the face of something like this would have immediately got defensive? See, this is Proverbs 26. I think it's 26, 4, and 5, two verses that seemingly contradict each other. We're told that, you know, not to answer a fool according to their folly, lest they, you become like them. And then the very next verse says, answer a fool according to their fo folly, lest they become wise in their own eyes. Th those two Proverbs have always confusimicated me, as we say, and I could never figure out why it is that one verse would say, don't answer a fool, and the other verse would say, no, answer a fool. And the, the key, the, the secret to unlocking that mystery, if you will, is that we're not to answer a fool according to their folly. In other words, don't stoop down to their level and respond to them in the manner in which they are responding to you. Don't react. Respond 
but your response should be simply, and this is something that I am learning, I have a long ways to go, but it's just simply a response that, like Gideon here, disarms them. A soft answer turns away wrath. This is Proverbs 15, 1 and 2. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Had Gideon said, Oh, really? I didn't call you to go to battle? Listen, if I would have called you men of Ephraim, you would have never went. You just want the glory. And he would have called a spade a spade, and it would have just escalated into this all-out, you know, battle, this knockdown, drag out battle. And by the way, don't we do that in marriage? To, no, not you guys. You guys have perfect marriages. I'm talking about other Christians, their marriages, right? But a soft answer turns away wrath. Verse 2 says, The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. It's been said, Never fight with a pig. I'm going somewhere with this. It doesn't have lipstick in it either. So never fight with a pig because you're both going to get dirty either way and nobody's going to win. You're still going to stink. And that's what would have happened. If he would have, you know, got down to their level and started going back and forth. Oh, yeah, me. What about you? That's the pot calling the kettle black. And you go back and forth. Have you ever done this? And after a, a while, you just kind of forgot what the fight was about to begin with? Why is that? Because that's where folly goes. That's where folly goes will take that type of answering of a fool according to their folly. More better. Soft answer, which turns away wrath. Charles Spurgeon says, A soft answer turneth away wrath. It showed a noble spirit in Gideon that though the sole conqueror by right, he covets no monopoly of the praise but even magnifies the exploits of others beyond his own, better yield to absurd people than engender strife among brethren. Did you catch that? He actually compares himself to them, and in so doing, he magnifies them. Who am I in comparison to you and what you've done, O men of Ephraim? I'm nothing. In comparison, he sort of in a self-deprecation brings himself down, humbling himself, and in so doing, he's able to turn away wrath. Not only is this good leadership, and I'm convinced and I'm learning again, have a long ways to go, but I'm learning that this is one of those character qualities in a leader that is an absolute must. You need to, you have to deal graciously with people because especially in leadership, you will be falsely accused of the very thing that the accuser themselves is guilty of. And that was the case of these men of Ephraim, which we saw last week. But not only is this good leadership, it's supernatural discernment on Gideon's part. And the reason I say that is because Gideon knew his place. Now stay with me. He had supernaturally discerned that he was not to be the vessel with which God would use to put the Ephraimites in their place. I'm of the belief that the Holy Spirit spoke this to Gideon. And what's interesting is that it would come vis-a-vis -vis this judge by the name of Jephthah, whom we'll meet when we get to Judges chapter 12. That's who God would use to deal with and even judge the Ephraimites. If you want to, uh, maybe you have already, read ahead. It is a bloody, gory chapter. Thousands of these men of Ephraim die because of what they did. But God doesn't use Gideon, and I really believe that God spoke this to Gideon. Gideon, you're not the vessel that I'm going to use in their lives. I will meet this out with and in and through 
another. You know, sometimes, especially when it comes to witnessing to, sharing the gospel with family members, you know, a, a prophet's not welcome in his own hometown, right? You know, uh, because they're always going to see you as that, you know, bratty kid when you were younger and that horrible, rebellious, awful, uh, evil teenager, <laughs> you know. And so yeah, this, this is one of the things I ran into uh, in my hometown. Uh, you know, here, here's this and I was the worst of the worst of the worst, and then all of a sudden I become a pastor, and they just couldn't accept that. It just was unacceptable because they knew me, you know, before when I was a kid, and I was a really bad dude. And so I, it, I'm not the vessel in their lives. They're not going to receive from me. So what I do is I pray for another to be the vessel in the life of that one whom I know I'm not the vessel in their lives. They're not going to receive from me. I cannot speak into their lives. And that requires, though, by the way, a supernatural discernment. And God will give you that. You know, when, and usually it doesn't take necessarily a rocket scientist to figure it out. I mean, when they, you know, call you four-letter words and spit in your face, pretty good, uh, you know, a hint that you're probably not the vessel, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> pray for somebody else, for God to send somebody else that can reach them, that can speak, you know, into their lives. Well, again, Gideon, I believe, knew that he was not at this time in, in this place with these men, that he was not the man that God would use. And sure enough, we'll see it with this Jephthah. To me, this speaks to how that those who will complain, criticize, even falsely accuse, won't get away with it. I mean, never imagine that God isn't keeping track. God will deal with them. He's just not going to deal with them now. Yet, see, absent a godly sorrow that leads to repentance, there will come a day when the heavy hand of the Lord will come down on complainers, those who cause divisions amongst the brethren. You know, in the Proverbs, I think it's chapter 7, six things the Lord hates, nay, seven that are an abomination to the Lord. That's a word we uh, really kind of don't uh, really use much in our vocabulary, let alone understand the weight of it. An abomination is to the Lord something that is so unspeakably wicked. And it's interesting, you know what that seventh thing is that he adds to the list of six when he says no seven that are an abomination, it's one who sows discord amongst the brethren. Why does God take that so seriously? So as to actually hate it. He doesn't hate them. He hates what they do. Why? Why does he hate it so much? Because of what it does to his people. The damage, irreparable in some cases, to the brethren in a church body, a sowing of discord, a false accusation, complaining, murmuring, will absolutely destroy a church. And that's why God hates it. It may not come in the way we might think. I mean, I would have liked for God to have just used Gideon right here, right now, chapter 8, get it over with, just, you know, zap him like he did with, you know, Moses and his cousin Korah in Numbers 16. You know, just open up the earth and just swallow the whole bunch of them. Actually, he's going to wait till chapter 12 to do it. I would rather he didn't wait. I would rather that he did it in chapter 8. But God doesn't always do things in chapter 8 in our lives. <laughs> Sometimes God will wait. And we hate it when God waits, don't we? Think about it. There's three answers to our prayers. It's going to be one or the other. Yes, no, or wait. Which one do you hate the most? You know, I, I'm okay with a no because I'll just pray differently. And, and, 
Well, you, come on, you do that too. <laughs> you know, no, okay, how about, and I'm just like a little kid, okay. You know, I just keep badgering the Lord about it and, and then to try to get him to say yes, change his mind. It never works, but I try anyway. But I'm okay with a no, no, and I'm most certainly okay with a yes, but the one that I have the most difficult with is wait, because I want to know why. Why do I have to wait? I hate to wait. Funny story on the mainland years ago, kind of freaky actually. Um, I was late. I get in the car. I leave my home office and I'm driving and I'm, you know, trying to, you know, I, it, it, by the way, I, this is before I was a pastor, so don't, you know, stone me to death yet. But I'm in my car and there's this car in front of me. It was a Saturn. I'll never forget it. This is years ago, but I remember it like it was yesterday. Here's this Saturn. And it cuts me off. And, you know, of course, I'm always looking for a fish or some sort of Christian sticker on the back because that, that just adds insult to injury when a Christian does it, right? Um, but they didn't have any, uh, you know, fish or anything like that on the back of the car. Instead, they had a personalized license plate. And if you're anything like me, you like to figure out those puzzles on, right? I, I, sometimes the, these personalized plates, by the way, in Hawaii, some of them are, are kind of hard. I'll get with you after the Bible study. Maybe I can, uh, you can help me out with some of the ones I'm still trying to figure out. But this particular one had an H-8-2-W-8. You probably got it. Hate to wait. And I'm thinking, the audacity, the nerve of this car to cut me off with personalized plates that say hate to wait when I'm late. And then it dawned on me. It's one of those moments where you realize, oh my goodness, this could be a moment of discernment. Could this be the Lord? Yeah, I think. <laughs> you know it's bad. You know you're not listening to the Lord when he has to have a car with personalized plates <laughs> in order to speak to you. If God has to resort to personalized license plate to speak into your life, you're in trouble. I'm just telling you from personal experience. And here's the freaky part of it. It was close in proximity to my home. And I drive that road every day and had for years, and I never saw that car again. So it was the Lord. Anyway, back to our Bible study already in progress. <laughs> it may not come in the way we think. It may not come by whom we think or at the time we think, but God. God will do it in His time, in His way, and for His glory. I think it's Psalm 34, maybe it's 37, I think it's 34. Do not fret when evil men succeed in their ways. The justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Don't fret, it leads only to anger. And James tells us that the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. You, if you're uh, responding or reacting in anger, you'll never do what is righteous and pleasing and acceptable in the eyes of the Lord. One more thought before we move on to verse 4. We're not making much headway tonight either, are we? Uh, it has to do with another practical point as to the why behind the what of Gideon's response. More specifically, the reason why Gideon was so tactful, so gracious, so discerning in what his response was to the Ephraimites was, I believe in part due to how he knew to stay on message. Now, here, here's why I say that. Had he engaged in a battle against them, not picked his battle wisely, as we like to say, it would have derailed Gideon from what God had called him to do. You have to understand, this Medeanite victory is incomplete as of yet. As we'll see here later on in the chapter, there are still 15,000 men that they have yet to defeat with the same 300 men. And isn't it interesting too, uh, getting back to verse 1 where the Ephraimites uh, harshly rebuke him, Gideon, because he didn't call them to go into battle. 
against the Midianites? Well, hey, you're so, you know, interested in going to battle with us. We're still going to battle, so come on, let's go. But you don't see them going along with Gideon. It just exposes them for who they really are and what they're really about. Well, let's move on. Verse 4, when Gideon came to the Jordan, he and the 300 men who were with him, this is why we know that the Ephraimite men in verse 1 didn't join him in the second phase of the battle. So the 300 men who were with him crossed over exhausted, notice, but still in pursuit. Then verse 5, he, speaking of Gideon, said to the men of Sukkoth, please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, speaking of the 300, exhausted, <laughs> and he tells them such, for they are exhausted. <laughs> and I am pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. And the leaders of Sukkoth said, verse 6, <laughs> are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand that we should give bread to your army? Are you kidding me? Is, is this a joke? It, w wait a minute. Am I being pranked? Where's the cameras? We just delivered the Mid Midianites. Okay, I'm not going to yell. I said, we just delivered the Midianites into your hands. These are their Israelite brethren here in Sukkoth. We, and you won't give us bread? My 300 men are exhausted. And we're going to cross over and finish the battle. Finish this victory that God is going to give into our hands. And you're not going to help us out by just giving us some nourishment, some bread? I mean, is it just me or is this difficult to get your mind around? I mean, is it just me, or does this just fill you up with this righteous anger? How can this be so? I mean, I can't imagine how it is that they would refuse to help them out. I mean, after all, they are their brethren going into battle, exhausted no less. Even the way they refuse to offer the bread is unbelievable. Did you notice that they're mocking of Gideon? Suggesting to Gideon, who are you? And what makes you so sure that you're going to be victorious when you cross over into battle to finish it off? And why should we give to you any bread? And they downright refuse them. Okay, let's try to work this out a little bit, and I'll, I'll do my best without uh, getting my blood pressure up. <laughs> it's as if they're telling Gideon, don't be so sure that you can finish the battle against these remaining Midianites. In effect, if you really think about it, what they're saying to him is, who do you think you are? It's kind of along the same lines of what the Ephraimites were saying to him. Who do you think you are? You want all the credit for yourself. You want all the spotlight on yourself for this victory over the Medina. Why didn't you call us so that we too could participate in, in this victory? You're a you know, a victory hog, if I can say it that way. Who do you think you are? And so there's sort of a hint of that in what these men of Sukkoth say to him in their refusal to him to help him out. And then it's almost as if they're telling him, you know, we're not so sure that you're actually going to come back victorious. Well, wait a minute. God has already insured, assured them of the victory. And we're going to see that in a most interesting way here in a moment with a very interesting detail that's recorded for us in the narrative. But it's like they're telling Gideon, you know, the jury's still out. And why should we help out until we know for sure that you're going to be victorious? Why should we give you bread? Why should we help? 
Why should we support you? Why should we join hands with you? What they're saying is that they don't want to help out their fellow Israelites only to have them at the end of the day defeated by the Medeanites. And this is really important, and I, and I don't want you to miss this because uh, it's not easily visible at first glance. I believe they are afraid if they take God's side and help out the army and stand with God's people, it may in fact bring about a retaliation by the Medeanites if the Israelites are defeated. Just a thought, but I believe they fear retaliation from the Medeanites, which is why they don't want to help out, because in the Medeanites, if they were to defeat the Israelites, would take revenge on these men of Sukkoth. I tell you, this sends shivers up and down my spine because it speaks to how we as Christians are prone to fear reprisal in taking a righteous stand. Now, hear me out. Uh, I would venture to say that this is the number one reason that Christians will refuse to take a righteous stand in confronting sin or, if you will, Medeanite evil. You'll forgive my the way I put this, but this type of Christian has no spiritual spine. And this type of Christian is only concerned for themselves in their carnal fear, and that's what it is, a carnal fear, a fleshly fear of retaliation were they to confront. I'll take it a step further. I believe, and I've experienced this in my Christian experience, one case was relatively recent where we just couldn't keep our mouth shut concerning a, an issue. I, I, yes, there was sin involved, but um, we, we just couldn't keep our mouth shut. We had to say something. And we knew that it might cost us our relationship with the other party whom we were confronting. Now, having said that, this is why I believe that the main reason Christians will keep their mouth shut and say nothing to someone who's in sin is because they fear the repercussion from it. This is why we don't confront people. We know that to do so would put the relationship in jeopardy and they won't like us. See, we want people to like us. See, we won't speak the truth in love because we love. Why? Because our love is for self. This is self-love. This is a kind of a dramatic way to illustrate it, but uh, let's say that you go into the doctor and the doctor uh, diagnoses you as having cancer. Now, the doctor is faced with a decision. He has to tell you the truth. But he chooses not to. Why? Because he wants you to like him. The wounds of a friend are faithful, but an, and, but, but an, and it can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses, the Proverbs say. In other words, you're my enemy if you only tell me what I want to hear because you fear my not liking what you're telling me and thus me not liking you for telling me. You're my enemy. You're not my friend. Conversely, you're my friend if you'll tell me that which will be wounding to me. But the reason that you're speaking the truth to me is because of your love for me. And that love that you have for me is more than the love that you have for yourself. Because initially, I might resent it, but eventually, I'll appreciate it. And this is what I'm learning in my own Christian experience, is that initially, people will hate you and resent you for speaking the truth to them. 
But eventually, they'll thank you. They'll thank you. It may take years down the road. Sometimes this side of heaven, we never are the recipients of that thanks for being honest. But you know, when we're told to speak the truth in love, I'm of the belief that that doesn't just mean we speak the truth in a loving way. Certainly we do that, okay? But we not only speak the truth in love, we speak the truth because we love. See, this is why I'm convinced that my wife loves me so much. She's, all, <laughs> she's always telling me the truth about myself. And, you know, I just, the wounds of a friend, the wounds of a wife in the JDV are faithful and can be trusted. I know she loves me. See, if she didn't love me, she wouldn't bother. I mean, why, why bother? Proportionate to my love for another will I speak the truth to that other. And so, in the case here with, with Gideon, I, I just, for the life of me, can't imagine how it is that they would refuse him help. And by the way, Gideon is about to speak truth to them, <laughs> and then some. So let's at least uh, take a couple more verses, and we'll see how much for, further we can get. So verse 7, Gideon said, now listen to his response, for this cause, notice this, when the Lord has delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, then I will tear your flesh in Jesus' name. Could you imagine that? In, a, in the context of brotherly love, you're confronting somebody. In Jesus' name, I tell you the truth. <laughs> I will tear. It doesn't work. I, I hope you know that. But then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. Then... He went up from there to Penuel and spoke to them in the same way. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Sukkoth had answered. In other words, they too refused to help. So, verse 9, his response, he also spoke to the men of Penuel saying, when I come back in peace, I will tear down this tower. <laughs> Have a nice afternoon. I'll be right back. Listen, if anyone... <laughs> to use the prior metaphor, had any doubt about Gideon's spiritual spine, these verses certainly put it to bed once and for all. This is, again, what I call a righteous anger. And it's a sanctified strength on Gideon's part. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. Jesus, in his anger, had a righteous anger because they had turned his father's house in the temple to a den of thieves. And his house was to be called a house of prayer. And he turned the tables. You might say Jesus was righteously angry. You know, these pictures, these images we have of Jesus being this frail, you know, man, perish the thought. I mean, first of all, he grew up as a carpenter's son used to carrying large amounts of lumber on a daily basis. And I just imagine him being rugged and tough and strong, not intimidating. But there was a sanctified strength. And there was a divine, God-given authority from the Father. And when he went into that temple, boy, I tell you, <laughs> that was anger. And rightfully so. And this is the same kind of anger here on Gideon's part. But I want to draw your attention to how he says, when I come back. Notice he doesn't say, if I come back. Because that would imply that the victory was still uncertain and not assured. No, when, it reminds me of when Abraham, with his two servants, takes Isaac whom he has just been commanded by from the Lord to uh, sacrifice his only begotten son from whom the promise would come, the promised seed 
making his descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore, which interestingly, and there are people who have minds for this, I am certainly not one, but they actually figured out somehow that there's just about as many stars in the, in the sky as there is sand on the seashore. How cool is that? <laughs> anyway, um, again, I don't know. Some people just have the ability to figure that stuff out. I'm not one of them. But the point is, is that he was to take his only son, his miracle son, and sacrifice him. And when he says to his servants, you wait here as he was ready to go with Isaac, who, by the way, forget the flannel graph Sunday school lessons, he was 33 years old and a type of Jesus Christ who on the same mount, Mount Moriah, at the same age of 33 would be sacrificed, which was the typology and who Isaac pointed to in his picture of the person of Jesus Christ. But he says to his two servants, as they're getting ready to ascend to Mount Moriah to sacrifice his son, he says to his two servants, we will return, stay here. He doesn't say, I, singular, will return. Why is that so significant? Because he knew by faith that God had promised through Isaac to multiply his descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. He didn't know how God was going to do it. He just knew by faith that God was going to do it. And so he said, when we come back, some believe that he believed that God would just resurrect him after he was obedient to sacrifice him, which you know the story. He didn't allow him. He knew, tested what was in his heart. And not because God didn't know. No, God knew. But he needed Abraham to know. Because this would be significant and a turning point, a defining moment in Abraham's life and his walk of faith. But so Gideon says basically the same thing. He says, when, not if. Because by faith, I know the Lord when he delivers Zeba and Zalmunna. I'm going to come back. I'll be back. <laughs> and I'll be back in peace. Now that doesn't mean <laughs> in peace with them. No, he'll come back in peace, not war. Why? Because the victory has been completed. And he knew by faith that God would do it. I can't get over <laughs> that Gideon isn't even asking these men of Sukkoth and then subsequent to them, the men of Penuel. He's not even asking them to go to battle with them. All he's asking for, he's not asking them to risk their lives, go on the front lines. All he's asking for is some bread, man. Just some bread, just a, a bun. Do you have a bun? Can you just spare a bun? How about a croissant? I, I don't know, whatever, a muffin. You got a muffin? That's all we need. <laughs> and they refuse him. I know I'm being silly, but we're almost done. At least for tonight anyway. <laughs> in fact, we'll pick it up in uh, verse 10 next week. We will get through chapter 8 before the rapture. I can assure you of that, <laughs> Lord willing. But... <laughs> The reason I point this out is that oftentimes those to whom we look to for support may not be the ones who in the end are going to be there for us or come through to help us. But it's in those times that God, in spite of them, will give us the victory without them if for no other reason other than to bring judgment on them. Think this through with me and we'll uh, bring it in for a close. Have you ever wondered sometimes when you're in a situation similar to what Gideon finds here, you, you know, someone has you know, rejected you, betrayed you, uh, not come through for you, uh, you know, refused you, not offered to help you, in fact, hurt you. Um, have you ever wondered sometimes that maybe what God is doing is he's using you to be the heavenly sandpaper in their life? 
Now think about that for a second. Yeah. I, listen, yeah, I do not want to have the gift of sandpaper in another person's life, but <laughs> for obvious reasons. But um, l- let, me, let me phrase it a, a different way. Have you ever had those times when you're in a trial, you're going through a very difficult time, and you're kind of you know, racking your brain and beating your head up against the wall, trying to figure out why it is that the Lord is allowing you to go through this, or why it is that someone to whom you had, you know, trusted would all of a sudden just, you know, not come through for you and not be of a support to you and not be there for you. Uh, Have you ever wondered if maybe it's not for you, but for them? I've been in trials in my life where I have been so perplexed by the complexity of it, the enormity of it, that I just, I could not, for for the life of me, figure out what it was that the Lord wanted me to learn in it. And in those trials, the Lord would minister to my heart and speak to my heart that, uh, oh, my dear one, (laughs) This trial is not chiefly for your benefit. I'm actually allowing you to go through this for the benefit of another. To which I respond, You mean (laughs) I'm going through this painful trial for somebody? Who is it, Lord? (laughs) So then you figure out who it is that the trial is for and for the benefit of. You're like, You! 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 Hurry up and learn from this so we can get out of this. We're in this together. What's the matter with you, you thick skulled, stubborn, stiff neck? You know, like me. It takes one to know one. But sometimes God may allow you to, you know, be in a situation like that because He's going to use you as the heavenly sandpaper in the life of another. It might be that you become the instrument of God's heavy hand in the life of another. He might use you to confront another. He might use you as the instrument of discipline in the life of another. It's nothing we want to sign up for, but sometimes God will deem you a worthy recipient of such a thing. You know, there's been times in my life where, this will be my final closing and we're done, (laughs) but Sometimes in my life, I have um, questioned, Lord, really, you know, why me? I don't want to have to always be the heavy, as it were. Why do I always have to be the one to, you know, roll up my arm sleeves and, you know, do what it appears others have been heretofore unwilling to do? And the response I get from the Lord is, because I knew that you would do the hard thing and the right thing, thus I deemed you a worthy recipient of such a thing. Because I knew you would do the right thing. And if I knew you wouldn't, then I'm not going to give it to you to do because I cannot be party to your disobedience. Think about that. The Lord will not call us or command us or give to us something to do if He knows that we won't follow through with the strength of character to do it. Because were he to do that, then he becomes by default party to our disobeying him and not following through and doing it because it's the hard thing. It's the right thing. So he says, you know, I was searching around and I found you and I know you and I know that you'll deal with this. So that's why you're the recipient of this. So now go do it. Yeah, but Lord, they're going to hate my guts. They already hate your guts, by the way. (laughs) Get over it. That's just the reality of it. They already hate you. They're just going to hate your guts more. Okay? So (laughs) that's a good place to end. Let's stand. (laughs) We'll pray. Have the worship team come up. Lord willing, we'll pick it up in verse 10 next week. Lord, thank you so much for your word and all that is here in what we've seen tonight. Lord, we want to be those who hear, read, hear, and take to heart what we learn 
in your word. We don't want to just be hearers of your word. Lord, I know that you have spoken by your Holy Spirit in that still small voice to many of us tonight, myself included. And there are many things that we can glean from the text that apply to our lives. Lord, would you take those things now and begin that process, as arduous as it might be, of building it into our lives so it becomes a reality for our lives. Lord, we're asking you for this and in advance thanking you for this. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.